it's a portable console, but the console is also very portable. <laughs> Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian Arbuck, and today I'm joined by Joff Schumacher so he can share with us his experiences with the Nintendo Switch. If you would like to see show notes for this episode, go to thenexus.tv slash SO27. All right, so it is August... 30th the switch launched on march 3rd march 3rd yep. so we are basically six months out yep a half year out from launch so actually fairly good timing yeah and how and how long have you had yours personally i got mine at the beginning of april like i'm basically okay. a month behind all of the you know big youtubers sure sure and everything off so. so but you've had it for a good five months so you've had time to like yeah really get to know it use it to its fullest Yes. All right, so let's get right into it. Should we talk about specs first? Yeah, probably. All right. It's um, always a nice place to start. So, yeah, the Switch is definitely like the first console of its type because it's based on a mobile architecture. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's running the NVIDIA, um, I believe it's the X1 processor. I don't think that yes, they've like... that sounds about right. Yeah, I don't think they've officially like confirmed which NVIDIA Tegra processor it's based yeah, on. Yeah, because the specs just say custom Tegra. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, how much RAM did it have? Four gigabytes, I think? That sounds about right. Yeah. I don't know how you could possibly fit more, more into it than that. I don't know. I mean, there are phones coming out these days that have like 8 gigabytes of RAM, so anything can happen. But probably not at the $300 price point. No. <laughs> and I don't think it actually lists RAM at all on the specs. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a control F and I don't see it there. Yeah, let's see. Storage, it comes with 32 gigabytes internal, right? Yeah. At, at announcement time, that was one thing that... Uh, number of people complained about was mm -hmm. the very low internal storage but you can have you can put put in a micro sd card of absurd storage space yeah. into it it can hold up to two terabytes of store handled two terabyte micro sd card but i that wasn't a big thing for me i mean it is a little bit annoying that buying the switch you know that you have to buy a micro sd card right um is a little bit annoying but depending on how air quote hardcore of a gamer you are you can go as much money into that as you want so i just mm -hmm. spent what maybe 40 dollars probably not even on a 64 gigabyte ones i mean they only get cheaper and cheaper all the time and 64 gigabytes will go a long ways right anyway but so to plenty of people who are complaining a lot about that during launch i was thinking guys it's a portable console just look how smashed together and small it is you couldn't fit much i mean you could fit more into it because it's clearly possible but one thing that i can't remember his name i have it somewhere in the show notes the the ceo for nintendo oh, of america reggie yeah yeah reggie the during i had watched a few different in, interviews with him around announcement time and launch time and one thing he stressed on a few different points was they really wanted to keep a 300 hundred dollar price point for the switch mm -hmm. and so i'm willing to bet that the 32 gigabytes of internal storage was one of the places where they just decided to cut down to keep that 300 hundred dollar price yeah. point. yeah and i mean like having supporting a protocol that goes up to two terabytes is like that's just fine because even for my PC, you know, mm -hmm. like one terabyte is the size of the hard drives that I have in there that I store my games on. Exactly. Um, so actually, I'm kind of curious because like the, the size of PC games isn't necessarily going to be the same as like the size of Switch game. Or is, d does it tell you how big the games are? I definitely imagine that this is going to be pretty variable, you know, like the s really small kind of arcade style games are probably going to be um, not too big, but like Breath of the oh, Wild. Yeah. Would... I know if you look up if you're actually going out and buying any of these games on the on the actual shop page where you'd find them, it will say how much space they right. take on up. the online shop, like on the online shop, or if you were to get it from like Target or Amazon, really anywhere, mm -hmm. they'll have that information out on there. For most games, they do. It's just for the most part, data storage hasn't been constricted enough to where you really need to care. Mm -hmm. But now some people are going to need to care depending on how they do it. And it does have it on here. So let's see here. Breath of the Wild. 
because I'm wondering if what I'm looking at here is the game the actual game software or the save files right because there's since they sell both physical cartridges and they sell them on the eShop, mm-hmm. there's like there's like two or three different kind of configurations that they can be stored in right right yeah i'll get to that in a minute and actually this must be the the game save content because i have i have breath of the wild mario kart 8 deluxe and one two switch all in physical form Mm -hmm. in cartridges and so i see here breath of the wild and mario kart 8 deluxe and one two switch listed on here which would not so it can't be the game that um the software needed to run the games it must be the save files right which is interesting because one two switch there is no Actually, no. It does save some data because there's some because it saves your personal best on the mini games. Mm-hmm. But for one two switch, it's just labeled as zero point zero megabytes. It, <laughs> it's so nice. so little storage, just zero point zero megabytes. But so I want to say games like Breath of the Wild were like maybe like six gigabytes of like for the for the software to run the game. Um, and looking at my save file for Breath of the Wild. Um, it would probably be two save files because a friend of mine's played on here too and have his own one, but that's 0.433 megabytes. So Ooh. the so the actual game save files are just really negligible. I I remember seeing like an article or something that said that like oh Breath of the Wild this is like you know one of those hot takes right? It's like oh Breath of the Wild if you buy it digitally like that's almost the entire. Uh, storage space that is required you know, that that comes with the switch by default way over exaggerating but um for games like breath of the wild it's not negligible mm-hmm. it, so you would if you went all digital with your game collection and did not have a micro sd card you would fill up very fast yeah i mean you could easily just you can be able to just delete the software to run the game and keep your save files and be Mm -hmm. able to do that but obviously that's going to be a huge hassle and a big pain in the butt every time you get a new game so unless you're somebody who buys the game plays it until you're completely done with it forever for your whole life and you feel comfortable just deleting the software to run the game so, I mean, if you if you buy them digitally, do you have to keep them installed on your device? Or can you, like, you know, remove them and they're still associated with your account, just like Steam games? Um, precisely that. Okay, good. I haven't bought too much off of the online shop, but I have... Let's see here. For online stuff, the only one I own is Snipper Clips, but I've also downloaded demos for, like, Poyo Poyo Tetris, just to play Tetra. Mm-hmm. And the Disgaea 5 complete um, demo as well. Oh, I think I found that article you were talking about. Zelda Breath of the Wild takes up almost half of the Switch's storage. Half of it. Okay, Update so... from, this is from Polygon. Mm-hmm. Maybe consider buying the physical version. Because it says it requires 13.4 gigabytes of storage space. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild needs 13 gigabytes of space on the Wii U. So it, that must be accurate if they didn't need to update that okay. in the article. Okay. So yeah, quite literally about <laughs> about half of it. Half. Maybe I was thinking of some other games that are like, <laughs> well, there's got to be some games out there that it's six gigabytes. But yeah, you run out of space very very quickly if you don't have an SD card. So what are the three different like s- storage configurations that you can have? Right. So one is if you were to have. So if you go physical, um, have the cartridges, you don't have a micro SD card, then obviously the the software to run the game is stored on the cartridge, and mm-hmm. then your save files are on the Switch console itself. Okay. If you have if you go digital and you mm-hmm. don't have a micro SD card, obviously everything's stored on the Switch. Yep, both the software and the save files. Right. If you go all digital and you have, well, with any digital game, and if you have a micro SD card, the micro SD, by default, when you download it from the shop, the game play files, Mm -hmm. air quote, get stored in the micro SD card and the save files are stored on the Switch. Okay. So the Um, save files are always on the internal storage. Yes, they are always on the um, internal storage. And... That is part of a reason why of like in my opinion the biggest knock on the switch is that you cannot back up or transfer or copy your save files. That's really annoying. 
Yes. So if you lose or break the actual tablet console itself, mm-hmm. you're just you're just SOL. Your save data is just gone. And um, supposedly um, there are. I mean, obviously, there's got to be some way to be able to do it at some level, right? Right. Well, like about sometime in the first month after launch, at least one story that I can think of surfaced up on Reddit where somebody had broken their their um, tablet console, like cracked the screen or something like that, mm-hmm. like a phone, had it, had it sent in to get repaired from some tech shop or something. They're like, well, we can't fix it. We're just going to give you a new one. And the Nintendo technicians transferred all of his data into a new into a new console (laughs) so there is a way to do it some nintendo technicians supposedly have the power to do it Mm -hmm. so i mean if they want to give the consumers the gamers the power to do this they they just need to make some kind of software update at some level whether or not that'd be easy i don't know but that should just be a software update to be able to do that i mean this would be a perfect feature for the like online features right you know just have it like synchronize automatically to your account and then whenever you you know if you get a new switch or whatever everything just transfers oh, over just store stuff on the cloud you mean yeah that would also be very nice unfortunately nintendo's online services aren't even going to be fully out there until 2018 right and but, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a bit but yeah but in my notes for it like the 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 thing that i really dislike the most about the switch is the fact that you can't back up or save or transfer your game save right um files at all i've got multiple bullet points <laughs> complaining about this so much i mean just as a gamer it's frustrating to be handcuffed like that yeah it's it can be very nerve-wracking too to like know that if anything wrong happens with my switch you know all of my legend of zelda hours just gone Mm -hmm. forever and as a person who is a fan of nintendo it's just really disappointing because that's just just a huge step backwards and i really don't get why they wanted to do that to begin with if because it's your save files it's not the actual game files so it's not like you could claim that to be some kind of anti-piracy feature. Yeah, because, like, if you... So so you say that the software for the digitally bought games is stored on the SD card. Yep. If I pop out that SD card and plug it into a different switch... It will not work. Okay. Because when you put in a micro SD card, you'll be prompted by the console. A little pop-up will come up and say, we need to format format your micro SD card. Mm-hmm. And so then that micro SD card is formatted specifically and only for that one switch. Right. And so then it won't be recognized by, any, by anything else. No doubt it's being encrypted with like a specific ID for that piece of hardware. I'm sure. So they've got... Um, piracy protection already built into having the the digital copies of the games on there Mm -hmm. so i mean like the first thought is well if you transfer the game save files onto the sd card when those be encrypted too and not be usable in any way shape or form well yeah but well you can can probably selectively encrypt stuff on the sd card Uh, exactly yeah so they they just got to make a software update mm-hmm. for that. And so, and my last point on this particular matter is there are games that are out for the Switch or will be coming out for the Switch where this save file fiasco is seriously um, affecting with my my thought process on whether or not I would buy them mm-hmm. for the Switch. Because I've got, I've got my Switch for all of my Nintendo IPs, your Zeldas, your Marios, mm-hmm. your Metroids and Smash Brothers. And then I've got my own pc that i built myself for everything else right so for some games like ukulele it will be available on the switch but then i have to think to myself well i'm not going to be able to do anything with my game save files as opposed to on my pc i can do whatever i want on them right and so the so for games like that i'm looking at it seriously thinking well i could buy it on the switch and it'd be really nice to play it around but the lingering fear in the back of my head on what if something happens to my switch and all of my game progress is just gone mm-hmm. forever so N- nintendo if you're listening to this get, get on this yeah fix it maybe when you do launch your on your online service next year you can put some kind of cloud service to be able to back everything up 
I guarantee you people will be much nicer to you if you do, <laughs> as long as you don't charge them for it. <laughs> All right, let's talk about that battery life, because this is a handheld as well as a home console. Yes, exactly. So battery life, very important. Nintendo giving the very, very not helpful vague range of two and a half to six hours. When I was looking at the specs, the two and a half didn't sound familiar because what I remember from the announcement time was they were saying three and a half to six. Mm. And that's just, maybe I'm just thinking wrong, but that's what's been stuck in my um, head the entire um, time. But so obviously your more intensive games like Breath of the Wild be closer to the minimum of right. two and a half. Right, right, right. But from my understanding, it's uh, supposed to get about three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. I've never actually timed it out. And for a game like Breath of the Wild, you usually have to focus on it a little more. So I'm not usually playing that one on the go where I'm walking around. I'm usually at least sitting in some spot. Mm. Honestly, most of the time that I've played on my um, in handheld mode, um, not docked to the TV with Breath of the Wild, was when I was living at my old apartment up in Minneapolis. My roommate Chris would be playing on his Xbox mm -hmm. on the TV, so I would just be like, okay, doop pop it out of the dock and just sit and play it on the couch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for that kind of thing, it works out very wonderfully because obviously I can just, I'm not going to be um, sitting around at my couch for three and a half hours. Right. Until the and the dock is right there across the room. Yes, exactly. But I did, the other day, I was actually just taking the light rail into downtown. I was just playing Legend of Zelda, getting a little quest in on the side as I was sitting on the train. And that was pretty nice. But I haven't fully tried... Just seeing how long, like, just walking around away from being able to charge it. The farthest I've ever been was with it was I took a flight out to Japan to visit a friend of mine who mm -hmm. lives out there now. But thankfully, on the very long flight where we actually went over the Pacific, we had outlets. Nice. So I've never played it, like, a really long stretch un undocked where the dock wasn't just right there across the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So does it, since it has a USB Type-C port for charging, mm -hmm. you can use it while it's charging, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. That makes a huge difference because then you can just have, you know, a portable battery with you and that expands the uh, the battery life by many magnitudes. Yes, exactly. Um, recharge time. Oh, yeah. Is one thing. Um, on the Specs website, it's they claim about three hours to fully charge it. When I... First that, that seems my, really long to me. It It is a long time. Um, uh, I tried it myself, and it was a while ago because when I was first got it, but I remember it being about two hours. That still seems really long to me. It is really <laughs> long, um, where, as you know, my phone can fully charge in, you know, like maybe not even half an hour. I haven't timed it. But, yeah, um, considering that you could get – considering that you could get, like, three and a half hours of playtime mm -hmm. out of Breath of the Wild, and then it took takes you two to three hours to recharge it, it is it does really take a long time for it to charge. So And if you okay. were to use from what I've heard, if you use something that isn't uh the official USB, port. Yeah, the official port or some some non Nintendo USB three USB C cable. I've heard some people say that it might charge slower. I haven't tried it. Hmm. Not because I'm not gonna try to charge it with my phone charger. Because yeah, I mean it's got a four thousand three hundred and ten milliamp hour battery in it. But mm. that's like that's not that much more than your typical cell phone, which are you know range from like two thousand to three thousand usually. Yeah. So it does take a long time to to fully charge. How about that kickstand? <laughs> gonna be preaching to the choir because everybody <laughs> says the same thing the kickstand is crappy it is just flimsy as all hell and i swear every time i i pull it out i think i'm going to end up breaking it mm -hmm. you can even try it yourself there and then like actually staying if you were to actually like set it down mm -hmm. and then just like nudge it a little bit with your finger you can feel how very unstable it is oh yeah 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 uh, yeah, because you set it down, and first it has to sink a little bit for the kickstand to actually catch. And mm -hmm. then, you know, if you poke the opposite side of it at all, it just falls over because it's such a short kickstand on. And it's all the way over on the right side. 
Yeah, it's not exactly. centered. Yeah, it would have been a much better idea. I'm not claiming credit for this. I heard this from somebody else, but it would have been a much better idea if the whole back casing was just one large kickstand. Yeah, and like, then it would be like a, the Microsoft Surface. Exactly. Yeah. And it would be a lot more stable that way. And the other big one is that you can, it's not like it's, it's not adjustable at all mm -hmm. at what angle you can have. And it's a pretty steep angle. So if, so you almost have, you have to basically be at, some configuration where your eye level is higher up than the switch because if it's even close to about the same like the angle is just really weird mm -hmm. it doesn't play nicely so, so that'd be that'd be another thing that they could learn from the microsoft surface because that hinge is like you know completely variable you can have it at whatever angle you want up to like you know a hundred and and 20 degrees or something like that you know yeah exactly so i'm not sure if nintendo really put that much thinking um behind the kickstand someone probably said oh yeah we'll probably need a kickstand okay we'll just slap yeah a, a, a thin sheet of plastic on it not much to say about it there all right so you wrote down bluetooth here as an entire section which i think is kind of funny because <laughs> It is a little, uh, well, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, but like when the part of the Spec um, sheet. announcement and the release was that people found out they couldn't use wireless headsets with it, which mm -hmm. people were pretty bummed out about. I wasn't, I, I wasn't too worried about that. I, uh, I wasn't going to be in a spot where I'd be having a headset while playing my switch me personally. But one day I was just looking at the specs and I went, oh, no, it's got, it, like, this was before launch. It's like, it's got Bluetooth in it. It should be fine. Mm -hmm. And then launch comes out and you can't connect the headset to it. And it's like, but it's supposed to have Bluetooth in it. And one day I actually looked at the official specs from Nintendo. It's like, it has Bluetooth built into it. So why can't people use headsets with it? Like wireless headsets with it. Because the Bluetooth is actually for the Joy-Con controllers. Mm -hmm. That's how they wirelessly um, connect to it. So... I thought that was just really weird how you you have the hardware built into it and I don't I don't know how hard it is to make drivers to make it accessible for you to hook up a, a headset, but it's not like it's a wild and radical thing that nobody's ever done before. I know. I mean like I'm sure that NVIDIA has plenty of Bluetooth drivers for headsets because they make android tablets with the exact same chipset as this thing you know exactly um and it's just like it feels so silly that i mean yeah they have a an audio jack here for headphones but if if you are a consumer who has entered the world of i have a phone that doesn't have a headphone jack anymore and you've like gone full bluetooth mm -hmm. You want to be able to connect that to like all of the devices that you're using, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's why I have it in here because honestly, it's a bit confusing to me. And it's not like they, storing the the drivers on the on the tablet storage would take up that much space. Probably not. No. No. I mean, somebody yeah. with eighty million different headset drivers all on one switch. <laughs> And fortunately, this is something that, you know, if, if we push Nintendo enough about it, they could update it. Exactly. With it's software. another thing that's just a software update. Yeah. So, like, honestly, they are a couple of software updates away from... From like, greatness. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, honestly, from taking away the biggest knock that's out there against the Switch with the, with the save file mm -hmm. dumbness. So... Yeah. So speaking of um, headphones, how good are the speakers that are built into the thing? I think they're just fine. I'm not a person who's much of a sound snob, but they. Uh, one thing to note is they can actually get pretty loud, um, and so it's not. You're definitely not going to be a situation where if you're playing in hand, um, playing it undocked, and you mm -hmm. don't have um, earbuds or something plugged in. It, where it's going to be too quiet. Okay. You're not going to have that problem at all. So where, where are the speakers located? They're is it, right is it... on the top. So you see something that kind of looks like it looks like an exhaust for fans. I'm pretty sure that is the exhaust for the fan. I'm trying to think. Is it, oh, no, is no, it no, those no. two I'm grills sorry. at the bottom? Yeah, the grills on the bottom and the back. Okay. It feels like a really weird place to put them facing away from the, the listener, you know? Yeah, it does, but 
like I've said, I've ne- I've never had an issue where playing it undocked with because I don't play it undocked with I don't actually use earbuds too mm-hmm. much with it. So I've never had a problem with being able to hear it at all. Okay. Even though it's working against the the player. But really I don't think there's too many better places you can put it because you right. can't put it in the front obviously because you need all of the screen that you can get um how about a microphone do you know if it has a microphone i thought that it did and i suppose the only way that you would have encountered that kind of thing would be if a you specific game actually like utilized a micro yeah into it which well not too on common the, on the switch specs it says headphone slash mic jack so i'm not right. sure right i'm not that that kind of implies to me that there might not um be just an internal microphone built into it which sounds a little bit surprising to me because they've done nintendo's done a lot with weird voice command Mm -hmm. stuff they've done it with their ds line before so they're not afraid of making people shout on the subway train into their console they're holding in their hands yeah, so let's talk about, like, the HD Rumble and the Joy-Cons themselves. Yes, I have that down as my most underrated part of the Switch itself is the HD Rumble. Mm-hmm. And the only, like, game that actually uses it well is 1-2 Switch, which... Switch, which... Um, <laughs> which is not surprising because it's basically the... It, it's basically the Wii Sports tech demo. Mm-hmm. Which is why I'm, I'm so Switch. surprised that that game wasn't bundled with the the console itself and you know? that was one thing that uh reggie had been asked about in, in an interview before and for that he stressed the 300 hundred dollar price point and so apparently the um, on nintendo's end of looking at things they if they wanted to bundle one two switch with the with the console they would not be able to do that and keep the price point at $300. So they chose to keep the price point at $300 and not include it with it. I feel like they could have eaten the cost, though. I do, too. I mean, particularly since they're not having any issues selling this. I right. mean, it's, it's, still, like, it's still really hard to be able to get a hold of one. They're not going to have any issues just volume-wise moving the console along. So they probably could have been able to eat the cost just fine on that. One thing I will say is that One Two Switch doesn't have as much of replayability to it as Wii Sports does. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely a game that's nice to play once. Okay, <laughs> that's about it. Like I'll like I'll I'll take my Switch out to places with me, and I'll have people play One Two Switch just so we can get a group of people to do dumb, ridiculous things. Right. Um, with it, and then that'll be it. So I've done that like with three different groups of people. But so, 1-2 Switch is the only one that really shows off the HD rumble well. And I'll actually um, bring that up so that you can actually try it. Now, of course, Joff and I playing a motion-controlled game does not make great audio content. So I will just describe to you what we did here. We were playing a game where each of us was holding one of the Joy-Cons. And it was simulating... The feeling of holding a wooden box with an unknown number of marbles inside that were rolling around. And you had to try to figure out how many marbles were inside this box by tilting it and feeling them uh, roll around and hit the sides of the box. And I have to say that although, of course, it, it couldn't simulate like a shift in weight very well that, that would come with uh, marbles rolling around... It did do a very good job of giving you different feelings for just the marbles rolling versus uh, the marbles hitting the sides. And it did it precisely enough that I could feel like I I could count the number of times that the number that the marbles hit the sides of the box. um, And I could kind of tell which side of the box they were supposed to be hitting. Um, So it did a really good job there. So there's one safe cracker game where you just rotate the Joy-Con. You're supposed to feel the slight difference between like a normal tick and a slightly harder tick Mm -hmm. with the harder tick being the spot you want to hold to unlock, you know, get that um, tumble or whatever it is. And so I think that it's a very great little thing that um, (laughs) that can really add a lot to a game if it's just implemented nicely Mm -hmm. and it's just being completely ignored altogether right 
Uh, all right. So how about the screen? Which is it's funny because we have to talk about like two different scenarios here. Yeah, exactly. When it's uh, when it's docked, it kicks out full HD 1080p mm-hmm. to your TV. If it's in handheld, then it's just running at a cool brisk 720p. Mm-hmm. And that was another thing that. A number of people had complained about at announcement time. Me personally, I have a super fancy schmancy 4K TV and custom built PC that can kick out a 4K signal. And I just want to say, guys, you're not going to see that much of a difference between 720p and 1080p. It's well, yeah. So so when you're on a television, which is the assumption, you know, for for using the switch, Mm -hmm. um you know, across the room, 1080p is probably plenty. And also when you're on a six inch, you know, tablet screen, 720p is plenty. I mean, I probably wouldn't want to be reading for a long period of time at six inches at 720p, but... Probably not. I've, I've never done a lot of reading on a, on a small yeah. tablet device device like that before but I mean, you probably read a fair amount on your tablet yeah i do yeah um yeah but so with and that thing's it, at 1080p well if you end up getting a video game that makes you read that much there's probably an issue there right yeah <laughs> networking yeah um when they announced the switch one of the things they mentioned in their big announcement is that up to eight switches can wirelessly connect mm-hmm. and if i'm remembering this right it's not up to eight can connect to each other via a wi-fi network it's up to eight can just straight up connect to each other yeah they just make any... an ad hoc wireless network exactly and so i was really excited about that because mm-hmm. uh, nintendo's bringing back the land parties i mean Really, Nintendo's been doing that all along. They've been they've had fantastic support for just like getting together with a group of people and having all of your devices work together. At Game Club at Harding, I watch you know many many students bring in 3ds's and like a wii u (laughs) and actually a lot of times it's Super Smash Bros. Mm. You know and and like it's freaking amazing because. The Wii U serves as like the base station, you know, and, and then, then like, everyone's got their tablet controller thing. Yeah, yeah. The 3DSs just serve as a controller. They also like mm. can show exactly what's going on up on the TV screen on their own screen mm. as well, you know. And it's like, holy crap, that's that's such a slick system. And the the Switch is continuing that that trend. Yeah, honestly, I don't I don't know how like when I would ever get eight people together like you can they do up to eight for um smash brothers and obviously you can do that for mario kart but having eight whole friends <laughs> but yeah um when when they announced that that i was really excited about that do you know if the switch can do that with the wii u or with the 3ds i would presume not i have not heard anything I've never heard anything um, where anybody's asked about it or tried it, so I would presume not. Okay, because that is... Actually, I should probably ask my students who are at Game Club, because that is one of the things that I'm a little bit puzzled about with Nintendo's approach here, is that I assumed that since the Switch, you know, is both a home console and a handheld device, Mm -hmm. that this is going to be replacing both of their lines going forward, right? Mm -hmm. But they're continuing to support the 3DS. They're continuing to, like, pump out games for it. And there's been no announcement whatsoever about the future of the DS at all since the announcement Mm -hmm. of the Switch. And that was one thing that I had um, written down for... For speculation corner yeah on what does this mean for the for the future of the of the ds family mm-hmm. um i personally am putting on a tinfoil hat here and and saying that it is that the ds's days are numbered because i i don't know why they would want to compete with themselves right yeah um, i agree totally the two and then for any game that comes out on one console um, when's it coming out for the next one? Is it coming out for the next one? I mean, when they announced the Switch and, you know, the fact that it was portable, one of the first questions that people would ask, not the first, but in the huge first big batch of questions nestled in there was, well, when's Pokemon getting out yep, here? Yep. And they have, they have announced that there will be a Pokemon title in, I think at first they announced 2018, I think but so. since then I 
have heard that they've backtracked and pushed that to 2019. Hmm. That's a long time. Well, two years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but so I don't – I think they're – I think Game Freak wants to take their good sweet time for Pokemon on the Switch, which um, – which, which. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm I'm fine with that because I don't I with the amount of games that are on the Switch, uh, I think I'll be able to keep myself busy, and most people will be too. Not to mention they've been making games specifically for the DS, which is very unique in of itself. And now they almost have to kind of go back, go backwards to where they only have one screen to be yeah. able to make a game for it. They have to switch their thinking, if you will. <laughs> but yeah, I haven't heard too much else about Pokemon on the Switch other than it has been announced. Right. But yeah, so my presumption is that eventually in the long run, it will completely replace the, the DS system. Mm -hmm. I mean, if... It just seems like in the meantime, you know, you would want them to work together mm -hmm. to, you know, strengthen the greater Nintendo ecosystem rather than like, you know, like competing with each other. Yeah, Exactly. exactly. Um, so there's several different ways that you can control this thing, yeah? Yes. So with the Switch and the two Joy-Con controllers, you get your handy-dandy Joy-Con grip, mm -hmm. which holds the Joy-Con in a configuration that's as close as possible to your standard you right. know, controller, which it ends up working all right on its so own. Got to... I actually haven't used this too much because I personally enjoy having one, um, one in each hand. Um, but so obviously it's going to be very different because you've just got this large flat face in front of you. Um, so just that shape of it is very different. And then the fact that the buttons and the joysticks are much smaller, mm -hmm. which it's weird at first, but you get used to it pretty quickly. The one really weird thing about it is that with the bumper and the trigger fingers, because naturally you normally have it so that your pointer fingers are on the bumpers and the ring, your middle fingers are on the triggers. You can't. You <laughs> no, can't. I, they're I too small for that. Exactly. Like when I first got it, I would play with the Joy-Con grip a lot because I wanted to try to see how well it would work. Um, and I did that and it was fine. But then when I tried actually holding the... If I were to sit down and do that for long periods of time, my hands would start to cramp up. Mm -hmm. And then if I tried taking the Joy-Cons out of the grip and doing that normally, like you just can't, you just can't physically hold it and actually be able to control it nicely. So um, what I do is I just use one finger for both the bumper right. and the trigger, which right. is not too many situations where you're pressing both, right. or alternating between both. So that's that's probably the weirdest thing about it is you hold it and you're like, what do I do with my middle fingers? So my first my first instinct here, holding the Joy Cons in the grip, is I feel like they should have configured it so that the the Joy Cons were not a flat surface, but like slightly a little bit more contoured. Yeah, for being kind of kind of held in the hand. Yeah, like uh, like angled so that they're just slightly facing away from each other. You know, because mm, um, that's yeah. kind of naturally what my hands want to do. Yeah, and that's kind of naturally what a a normal controller um, mm -hmm. ends up doing too. But instead, you've just got this large flat face on it. And remind me, the one, the, the grip that comes with the Switch is not the one that has, that can charge your Joy-Cons, is that correct? Correct. When they initially announced the Switch, they didn't even have such a thing in existence. Mm. It wasn't until later on, like, closer to towards the um, release where they actually announced, yeah, there's a Joy-Con grip that has a charger built into it and that's another thing where you could look at and ask oh well why wasn't that bundled in with the switch that was probably another thing where they would cite well we were trying to keep it down to three hundred dollars and that wouldn't help um but your the the joy cons charge while docked mm -hmm. and they have and that's the only way to charge them right um, yeah out of the box yeah that is the only way to charge them but more importantly they have a battery life that is much longer than the switch's internal battery so if you're kind of situation where 
your Joy-Con is low on battery life, then you're you're you in very have... strange waters here. Yeah, exactly. Like you would have to you would have to be on the go and playing in tabletop mode for so long for such for such a ridiculously long total number of hours mm-hmm. on the go. So you mentioned that you like using it with one in each hand instead of connected. Have you played many games where you're holding one in both hands? You know, like the multiplayer games. Oh, um, yeah, Mario Kart. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so for that, it actually helps uh, yeah. to use the um, strap. If you look at it, on one side, there's a little plus. On one side, there's a little minus mm-hmm. to match up with the controller. So you could use either strap for either controller. Mm-hmm. That helps a little bit because it gives it a little more shape. And then you've got the little shoulder button extension. But if you were to, if you actually look inside it, it's literally just a spring yeah. with a little poker that um, pokes the shoulder button in the in the controller. Right. And so it's not bad. When the Switch was announced, one of my big questions about the Joy-Con was, well, is this going to be a thing where it's going to be awkward but livable, or is it going to be a thing where you're with a group of friends, you're like, hey, let's play Mario Kart, and your friend goes, uh, I am not playing with that controller. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's more of the former. It's a little bit awkward because it's off-centered and the buttons are smaller, but it ends up working just fine. Oh, yeah. I totally am bleeding from underneath my fingernail now because I... Wow, I just cut myself on the Joy-Con. That's amazing. Look at that. (laughs) Um, so you, it was still locked and you were trying to force it out. Uh, the little white thought... tab thing is a lock because mm-hmm. ever so not clearly, um, written on there, it does say lock. You do need to like yeah. shine it just right to, um, I, yeah, I it. saw that. Is it, which, which way is locked? Is it when so it's if inward you, or outward? If you see the, the wording lock, it has a triangle mm-hmm. pointing upward. So, um, if you push it in, that's locking it. If you pull it. So that it's kind of like pulled out a little bit from the strap, mm-hmm. then it's unlocked. I thought I had it unlocked. Um, even still, it can be that can be a little bit hard to take out, even when it's unlocked. Like you do, like I, you do feel like you're push pushing on it harder than you would like to. But um, you get... Go get something to wrap my thumb in. <laughs> a bandaid's not gonna work, but I need something to cover it. <laughs> So um, yeah, lesson learned here, kids. To have care when uh, <laughs> when sliding those those shoulders on and off. Um, but so using one Joy-Con as a fully functioning controller by itself for games like Mario Kart and um, like Snipper Clips. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if Super Smash Brothers would be able to do something like this. I would imagine so. I would hope so. What is the game that's out there? NBA Playgrounds, which is just the, it's, it's basically NBA Jam. But okay. Now, um, for the Switch, you could be able to do that kind of thing. It's a little awkward with it being off-centered and buttons being small, but it works just fine. And even if you don't have the, the strap on, like the little shoulder button indents that are on the top, it's actually not that bad not as bad as i thought it would be playing like without the strap to give you that extra Mm -hmm. satisfying proud button to push down on it is definitely different but it's but doable it's doable yeah um and so then so you've got it in the grip you've got it one one joy con as a functional controller um you're about to ask me a question about playing it with oh my (laughs) god (laughs) um playing games like breath of the wild where i've got one joy con in each hand Mm -hmm. i really like it because with the wii you could be able you had your nunchuck in your left hand oh yeah yeah. in the right hand so you could um so you could um you should be standing up while do while playing on the wii but you know practically speaking you're sitting on the couch Mm -hmm. with your hands just on your arms off to your sides and you'd be surprised how much more natural and nice feeling that is because you know most people when they're gaming they're used to just having a controller in their hand to where it's just natural but i'm so used to having my hands off to my sides (laughs) that a lot of times when i'm holding the controller down like it feels slightly constricting right (laughs) like that you're you're not ready for that hug that's coming exactly that's not the norm for me anymore like after having the having the wii and so that's that's how i just like to play it and I don't know who else, if anybody else actually 
does that. Like, obviously, if you watch YouTube videos, those people are probably using the Pro controllers because mm -hmm. they they like them better. So if if you're playing a game that uses motion controls, but you happen to be using like the Pro controller, for example, or if you've got it in handheld mode with the two Joy Cons attached to the sides of the the console itself how does that work how does um, the game so with the with the pro controller it has motion control built into it and mm -hmm. so it would work the same way as if you had the two joy con like in the in the grip you would just be moving okay. around the whole unit okay. as a whole to do that kind of thing and then if you have it in handheld mode it can be a little bit awkward because you're you're also tilting the screen that you are looking at to play the game right which for the for some things it's kind of fun to do um because in breath of the wild you have these um Sheikah slate abilities um one of them is magnesis where you um link holds the Sheikah slate in front of them like you're holding the tablet and it just works like a magnet you pick up magnetic things and link is just moving his hands around to control it and you're doing the same thing mm -hmm. um with either the controller or with the whole tablet as a whole and so that's kind of fun to like just pick up a metal box and just smash it on a bacoblin or something but so yeah um so we're talking about ways to do the do the controller so um handheld mode where you actually have it attached onto the switch pretty straightforward i guess not much to say about it honestly i I like handheld mo mode more than I thought I would because at launch I was thinking, well, I'm not going to want to do it in handheld mode if I'm not plugged into the TV. Um, it's probably because someone else is using the TV and I want to play, so I'll just have it in tabletop mode mm -hmm. all the time. Well, then I figured out for myself the issue of the, the wonderful stand that we right. talked about earlier. And actually what I would do more often than – using the kickstand was i would use my case that i got with my um, <laughs> um bundle because i could use this little flap in the middle as a prop to put it at a different angle um <laughs> so like that is a more friendly angle than this um the than the kickstand than the supports. kickstand holding That's it so like funny. this um, and so I could put it, I could put it like this, or I could even have it, I could, I can adjust it a little <laughs> bit. And I think there are cases out there that actually have a built in, like actual backstand with mm -hmm. a, actual adjustable, um, angles to it. So you can be able to use that. But so I, I have found that I end up liking handheld mode more than I initially thought mm -hmm. I would. So I think the last thing that we need to talk about with controllers is the pro controller. Yes. Yeah. So I've got it here in my hand. Um, I like the feel. That, so the first thing that I always like think of when I when I hold a controller is, is the feel do these, of it. Does it have a nice no, matte finish to give you? No, that no, no. It's it's or? the buttons. It's all about the buttons. Oh, yes. Like, do the buttons feel like they're going to give out on me after you know a certain amount of time? Is the um, click satisfying enough? Yeah. These these feel pretty good. Yeah. They, they've. They, yeah. They, this is not a cheap controller. No. Um, it's not like a pretty controller, but it's not a cheap controller. <laughs> there are services out there where you can mail them your pro controllers or their or your Joy Cons, and mm -hmm. they will they will professionally like take the casing off, give it a whole new paint job, mm -hmm. like sand it down, paint it, gloss it, or however you want it. Like they've got a matte finish or a glossy finish, right? Um, to be able to do whatever you put whatever color scheme you want. Nice on it. There's some nice ones out there. But yeah, it's a very solidly built controller. Some people like can talk for days about a uh, about a brand new controller with the reviews of it. I'm just like, yeah, it's a controller. A, a thing that might seem really obvious, but I can totally imagine Nintendo effing this up is it charges via USB Type C, just like the console does. Yeah. So that's good. Yes. <laughs> instead of having instead of having micro USB yeah, on it or yeah. something else weird. <laughs> proprietary oh, controller yeah. charger um but yeah but then in my hand i've got my xbox one controller that i use for my pc gaming and yeah. you hold the two up next to each other it it's very very comparable as far as just how they look mm -hmm. um, the button placement is the same yeah exactly um so if you know what a xbox 360 controller or Xbox One controller looks like and how it feels. The Switch is basically the same aside from the actual, like, finish on the plastic. Right. Yep. 
And so I mentioned the Pro Controller has motion sensing mm-hmm. in it. It also has NFC reader in it, as well as the ah. right Joy-Con for for all your Amiibo fun. Yeah. Um, have you ever bought an Amiibo? I have not bought. Technically, I have. Because the, <laughs> the bundle that I got for my Switch included the... Dark Rider Link, I think is the official title of it. Okay. Um, the one where Link is on a horse and the horse is doing the whole standing on the two legs thing. Mm, um, mm-hmm. That was part of the bundle deal that I got um, with it. So technically, yes, but I'm not in the market for them. So one thing that I just noticed is that the triggers on uh, on the Switch controllers the triggers is... do feel a little bit different. Well, no, I'm I, to me at the, least the difference. I mean, the difference is pretty clear. It's that they're just a digital click. You know, it's not an analog like you you press it in a little bit and a little bit and then you you know the yeah, way that it, the Xbox controller is. Yeah, exactly. Which is, I personally prefer like the the more mechanical end of it where like the like the Xbox One controller where you've got a little bit more leeway to it you mm-hmm. push in a little bit or push in a lot yeah so all of these peripherals this was one of the big things that i was most scared about when when the switch was announced is mm. how much they all cost how much am i going to have to buy for everything cuz you can't yeah. you can't just buy the switch along mm-hmm. with um, as i mentioned earlier you have to get a, an SD card to work as your memory card right. uh, for it. You, since and f- it's a tablet <laughs> device, you have to have a screen protector on it, which mm. is not expensive, but a decent tempered glass one is still going to cost you 10 to 15 bucks. Mm-hmm. But of course, those are going to be like the most negligible of the uh, peripherals as yeah. opposed to a second dock or the Pro Controller or extra Joy-Cons. Yeah, the Pro Controller is $70, which everybody agrees is overpriced. Mm-hmm. Personally... Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of good controllers are between, like, $50 and $70. So that's, like, on the upper range. I don't think it deserves to be on the very top of that range, but, it, exactly. you know, somewhere in the 50 to 70 range it would seem okay. It does have the motion control and NFC unit, so that's going to cost more, but... Yeah. Eh. Um, but, yeah, everyone agrees that $70 is a lot for it. Um, joy cons are even more expensive if you want a pair of joy cons that's eighty dollars yeah and if you want one joy con that's fifty dollars mm-hmm. so obviously motivating you to buy the two instead of buying one individually which yep. i don't know why you would um unless if one of them breaks and you need just a replacement if, for it if you live in a house of three people and you all want to <laughs> play mario kart and you want to be efficient about your money spending that would technically be the most efficient way to do it i guess so yeah <laughs> I think the most egregious one, though, is the dock itself, which is $90 for, like, a piece of plastic and a simple logic board. Yes, it is. It's That's just really bad. Oh. It is really bad. A lot of people have done a bunch of do-it-yourself videos on taking apart the dock so you can make one that's... So that you can make one that's even smaller, that mm-hmm. can be nice and portable, so it ends up just being, like, a little, a little dongle that you plug into the... Mm-hmm. Um, dongle on a cord that you plug into the switch as opposed to having an actual dock and if you want to be able to do that kind of thing you have to have the you need to actually rip out the board on the dock itself yeah to be able to do any kind of that fun stuff and here's so here's something that i haven't looked into is like the 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 board itself seems to be, you know, because, like, I could 3D print any one of these. You know, many people have been publishing, like, the scheme schematics for for the docs that they're making. Mm -hmm. But, like, you still have to put the electronics in there. And I don't know if you can just plug in the switch to, like, a simple USB Type-C to HDMI adapter, right? Because Mm -hmm. those totally exist in the world. I don't know if the switch supports those standard protocols. That's a very important question, that I just don't know the answer to. Yeah, which I would le- I would lean towards no, so that Nintendo right. can milk more money out of you, and that would have been more work on their end to to do to make it more compatible with other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it, that wouldn't have been that. You just implement USB 3.0, which yeah. supports a, a HDMI, and you know, but a, that's fine. a whole day of work for a developer. <sighs> 
<laughs> extra day. But yeah, the only reason I don't have a second dock is because it costs so much money. It should mm-hmm. be like 20 bucks. Right. Because f- have you have a TV up in your room and we have the TV downstairs in the living room. It would make perfect sense to just have two docks there. Exactly. For you I to would, choose. I would love to have two docks right now, but $90, I'm not paying it. I'm mm-hmm. just not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The peripherals do end up being pretty pricey the only thing the only peripheral that's not expensive is if you want to buy an extra grip or an extra rechargeable like recharging grip i think mm. the recharging grips are 25 dollars. oh that's not which bad. i think is a very fair price yeah other things not as fair i was really really hoping that the wii u pro controller would be supported on the switch you know yeah because i think they have the exact same layout right your standard um, regular you know mm-hmm. controller um i don't know I don't know if the Pro Controller for the Wii U had the motion controls built in. Yeah, I'm That's... not as familiar with the Wii U because I never had... Between this, between the N64 and now, I have had every console except the Wii U <laughs> from, from Nintendo. But yeah, like that, that, that seems like such a no-brainer to me, you know? You would hope so. Re- reward but... your biggest fans who stuck with you through the Wii U years. Or you could... Or, or you could make them pay up more money and those are the people who would be the most willing to pay more money (laughs) true okay true 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 so it looks like we have a couple of things that were resolved with um software updates yeah when the switch was first resolved a lot of people were reporting connectivity issues specifically with the left joy con um interesting yeah like you would be you'd be playing legend of zelda um, having a fun time, and then all of a sudden, the left Joy-Con disconnects. You, you just can't work, walk anymore. <laughs> um, well, what happens when there, when what happens when there's a connectivity issue? Like maybe the batteries died, or the maybe, game just pauses. Yes, okay. it pauses and it prompts you to get your get your controllers like reconfigured. And when you're in the middle of fighting a Lionel in Breath of the Wild, that's the last thing you want happening. Right. Um. So a lot of people would end up dying because that would break the flow of the game so badly. And that was fixed by a by a, an operating system patch in the first two weeks after launch. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing was that some people were experiencing frame rate issues in Breath of the Wild if there was a lot going on on the screen, a lot of rendering stuff going right. on. And that was also resolved with a patch first two weeks after launch. Okay, good. And so, like, a lot of people at launch, you know, lot at launch there's a lot of question marks about the Switch. And so with issues like that coming up right at launch... Those they, are going to make headlines. Exactly. Yeah. And they Nintendo resolved them very quickly. Good. So Good. they did the right things there. Now, here's something that they're totally doing right. The online services. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it's non-existent yet. You can't it's, do anything wrong if it doesn't exist. Well, I mean, it... It exists, it's just that it's free for now, right? You know, they, they haven't started charging people for it. Technically, yeah. Technically, yes, and that you can play games online with people, and they now have a chat app, but it, everything else that goes along with the online service, not until 2018. Right. But yeah, not a lot is really known on how Nintendo is going to implement it, like their online service or services as a whole. They have a page for it because they announced it, a few months ago, it's like, this mm-hmm. is what we're going... Actually, no. At first, they just announced, we're going to have an online service. And yeah. we were like, okay, what are you going to do with it? We definitely didn't know what the pricing was going to be when they first announced. No. And now they at least have pricing out and some... I think that the pricing is really reasonable. Um, 20 bucks a year. Or, yeah. or you can go with like it's... month by month and pay $4 a month. Yeah, if you wanted to, which... I don't do the online gaming bit. That's part of why I have a PC console, so I don't pay an Xbox Live mm-hmm. um, subscription. But from what I remember, that is, 20 bucks for a year is much cheaper than like an Xbox Live Gold subscription. Definitely. Oh, definitely. What is that, like $60? Uh, or, for the whole year? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So a third of the cost, uh, which if I were to want to do the online bit, I feel like that's a very reasonable price. I'm personally not a huge fan of that kind of thing but so so what do you so what do you get for those twenty dollars a month a a year (laughs) (laughs) so you get online gameplay like Mm -hmm. if you don't have it you just can't do the online bit right you can do things with the switch online app which is what you use for like 
your lobby management stuff Mm -hmm. or chatting stuff. Classic game selection, which is, there's a lot of questions about that. It just sounds like a retro game library that you can be able to access. Like Kind of on a rotating basis, right? With the way it's worded now, some people have thought that it's going to be like the Netflix of retro games, which... Now, that would be fantastic. That would be very fantastic and definitely easily worth 20 bucks for a full year. Mm. That If that were the case, then I could potentially very much buy into it. <laughs> the only thing that would keep me from buying into it is I'm on the more casual end of gaming. And so just the amount of time I would need to put in to get my money's worth. Mm-hmm. But if that were the case, it would be wonderful. And then the last thing is you can get deals on the nintendo eShop, like you'll get discounts and stuff if you have the online subscription right and then things that you do get if you do not pay for the online services at mm-hmm. all you still get access to the eShop. good you can give them more money <laughs> exactly um you can register and manage friends i don't have too many friends who have the switch <laughs> <laughs> good uh, caveat so i'm not going to be able to do that for a while um you can Share screenshots to social media, which that's not a thing yet. Right now, I don't think there's... I don't know how you would get your screenshots off of this. I've never tried. Right. So I don't know if there is presently a way to do that or not. And then supposedly down the road, they're they're going to implement it so that the dedicated screen share button it also works as like a dedicated screen record mm. button. Mm-hmm. So you could be able to do that. It doesn't do it now, but supposedly they'll do that in the future. Yeah, so what what one thing that makes me kind of nervous about the whole, like, this is a console and it lets you share screenshots is the places where you can share screenshots are entirely up to Nintendo. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, if, if there is a website, some obscure place where you like to share your screenshots, but Nintendo's never heard of them, you know, that's, like... It's not going to happen. What's almost um, Tumblr? I've never heard of almost <laughs> Tumblr. You can't post your pictures there. <laughs> like, yeah, I would I would love to be able to just upload to arbitrary things or even like, I don't know, plug in a, a thumb drive and just mm-hmm. like transfer your screenshots and recordings over. The USB-C thumb drive. Yeah. I haven't seen those yet. They, they definitely exist. And so then the very last thing you get, regardless of whether or not you pay for the online service, is the Parental Controls app, which ah, yeah. they announced, they had that app out at launch time. And if you're a parent whose child wants to have a Switch and you have concerns about the, you know, about screen time, mm-hmm. I'm sure, as all parents do, the Parental Controls app gives you a very wide array of options that right. you can do. Um, If you just want to give your kid a warning that, you know, after X number of hours, just give them a little pop up that says, hey, should get them. You should get off of the screen. And then (laughs) and if they're good, they'll just do it and walk away. Or you could set a very hard limit of at X number of hours. It will lock your kid out. Yeah. If you're a parent looking into buying the switch, take a look at the parental controls app. I think it's pretty good. Have you have you added any friends on the system at all i know oh I, come I, on like i li- i literally know one other person that has a switch is another person who we went who is who went out to morris was at the mm-hmm. same college we were at and i because i just saw that you know on his social media page on facebook he posted that he's got the switch and playing Legend yeah. of Zelda and whatnot and so he's a nice guy but he and i weren't super close in college where i'm gonna friend him through nintendo okay because so. i because like That's one thing that I don't know is how do you friend people on this service? You know, like in the past, they've had these street passes or whatever that you like, you know. Are you talking? Like, like in the days of the 3DS. Of the 3DS where you could, where you could um, see the me's of other people as you're walking by them. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) I think that started all the way back with like the original DS actually. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I'm, I'm very curious, like, do you have a, a public profile, um, that other people can see on your, you know, Nintendo account? Is it, you know, is, is it like a fully fledged, like community thing, social media? And we'll have network? to wait and see on that. If you go as far as just general friends, friendless stuff, if you go into the system settings, there's obviously there's a users tab so you can see your list of users that are on the Switch. And if I go into my user, um, nickname, icon, and there's some friends functions in there, 
friend settings, manage, block user list. Okay. So for people who are going to really an- annoying you. Uh, oh, so display online status to all friends. Display online activity to all users. Huh. So that ha- there has to be some kind of like public, you know, user information out there right. at some level right. for all users to be a thing. Receive friend requests, friend notification settings. I'm still unsure how to actually add a friend. <laughs> have friends. Oh, yeah, there you go. Because on the home screen in the top left corner, you also get little bubble icons for mm-hmm. your, your users. So if you click on yours there, I go on to Joff's page. So I've got profile, friend list, friend suggestions, add friends, user settings. I see a friend code, which is definitely not user friendly. It is 4, 8, 12... 14 characters long. Okay, so that seems like that is a code that you have to give to somebody else in order for them to add you, maybe? That's what I presume. Because oh, boy. For the, for the Wii, that's how it basically works. Because uh-huh. I actually had friends who had the Wii. <laughs> but, so, yeah, you just got to give them this long and lengthy. Oh, but, man. Um, yeah, and then it gives some... Here's my public key. Send me encrypted messages. And so then it's got play activity here. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild played for 120 hours or more, which actually isn't that much. So I think this brings us nicely to the thing that uh, makes or breaks a console is the game selection. Yes, and uh, when talking about talking about the Switch in general, a lot of things people have talking were talked about were lessons learned from the Wii U. Yeah. Because in one way, just looking at the console, it's Wii U 2.0. Sure. Bit much um, better in just about every way, shape, or form. And one thing that people did talk about a lot when comparing the two was the game selection. Because one of the biggest reasons for the Wii U not doing so well was the game selection and third-party support for it. Mm-hmm. Right now for the Switch, they are definitely not having that problem. Well, I mean, so so when when if we just look at sheer numbers, right? Mm-hmm. At um when they were announcing the Switch back in January, the they had like eighty titles, I think, promised by the end of the year, right? Mm-hmm. Which was like like fifty less than what the Wii U had by the end of its first year. Really? Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, um. Most most uh, consoles have like way way more than that. And mm. scrolling through the uh, Nintendo eShop now, they've got about 130 available now. One thing that definitely probably did not take into account was the indie games that are available for Switch, which I think kind of surprised everybody. Cause, well, or at least nobody was talking about that when they first initially announced the Switch was. Mm-hmm well, how's the indie game market going to do on that? Because that's just never a topic to talk about that's talked about is indie games on home consoles because part of the reason right. why they're indie games was you would get them for cheaper on Steam. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they like there's even a new, like a term, Nindy and Indie, Nindy games. And for Nintendo. Um, in- yeah, just match together. <laughs> Nindy games for um, indie games on the Switch. And actually, just earlier today, they had their summer Nindy game um, release update where they announced all of these indie games that were coming out for Switch. Mm-hmm. And for a number of them, it was exclusively on the Switch or get it first on the Switch, where it'll wow. be on the Switch first and then probably up on Steam later. Mm-hmm. So they're really working the indie game market very much in their favor. Yeah. I'm wondering if so. One one thing that I was speculating about is since it is a mobile architecture, right? Mm-hmm. Is it? Did they make it really easy for like developers of mobile games to port stuff over? It, Does it? Use, it already like, has same... some mobile game ports onto it. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't have a definitive list, but one day I was just surfing the YouTube's and I found a game, uh, a video from IGN. Five games that you can. Um, that you can only play in undock mode because the games were uh, mobile ports. So you have to use the touch screen uh, to yeah, play yeah. the game. Um, that right there is an example of mobile ports that mm-hmm. are already on the Switch. Okay. And when I think about it, Nintendo has a bit of a history in that many games that you would buy on, that you would be able to get on the Xbox or the PlayStation, you mm-hmm. wouldn't just wouldn't be available for their consoles because those third-party developers wouldn't develop it for their 
for their consoles. Right. Um, but Bethesda's on board to bring Skyrim to yes. the Switch. So hopefully, um, working forward with the Switch, games that you would get for the Xbox or the PlayStation, you could reasonably have on um, the games have, that games that you would have for the Xbox or the PlayStation six years ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Because right, Skyrim came back out in like 2011, 2012, it was something like 2011, that. 2011. Yeah, because I remember that was yeah. spring semester of our freshman year out in Morris. Uh, looking at their game library as a whole, things have definitely been better from the from the Wii U. I wasn't aware that at launch they had fewer title um, game titles planned mm. as opposed to the Wii U. But one thing that uh, Reggie had mentioned when he reviewed was just keeping a consistent stream of games. Yeah. That was supposedly another issue with the Wii U. I mean, sure, you have, what, 80, uh, about 100 games out at launch, but then how much did that drop off after the first well, year? Well, the Wii U? oh, yeah, for the Wii U. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so like over the course of its entire life lifespan, which is still ongoing, one big problem from what I hear is that just having a consistent stream of games was a big issue. Mm -hmm. And at the present moment, like right now with their mainline games with breath, with breath of the wild, with Mario Kart, porting Mario Kart, getting, um, Splatoon two and arms out there. Um, um, and Mario, Mario Kart, Odyssey's, Super Odyssey's Mario coming. Odyssey will be coming out in October. Um, the Mario Rabbits. Oh God! Oh, uh, I, I was. Oh man. Um, I was so it's, disappointed it's when I saw coming, that. Yeah, it's coming pretty soon, or might even be. I don't know. I don't think it's out, but it'll be coming soon. So at least as far as like this first year goes, you're having on average like every other month a big name Nintendo title mm -hmm. coming out. And then with the Nintendo eShop just filling in with all these indie games has really helped a lot. Yeah. And some of them specifically you can only get on the Switch. Yeah. So. And actually, one thing that they're doing like fantastically is covering a wide range of price points. Yes. You know. Like there are some games that are literally like five or eight dollars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many of those are particularly good. I haven't looked yeah. um, too much into them, but yeah, if you there, but there are some games that are good that are fifteen dollars mm -hmm. on there. And then we can go all the way up to like the Breath of the Wild Ultimate Edition or whatever. That's like a hundred and twenty dollars. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, which you can't get anymore because you, oh. you got well, it came with all of that extra stuff. Mm -hmm. um, with it so physical you, items yeah with yeah, physical yeah. items so you wouldn't be able to get that from the eShop at all anyway yeah. but uh, so yeah at launch you had ea come out and say yeah we're going to put fifa out there which is one of the largest like largest selling games worldwide mm -hmm. out there so not small news there and you they've already got wwe 2k18 mm. available on the switch and bethesda's on board for at least getting skyrim out there we'll see about other games so I noticed that you've got some speculation points here. Oh yes, and I like I like corner. the sounds of these speculation corner. Oh yeah. Um. So VR on the Switch is that going to happen? So Matt Pat had a game theory on Nintendo's true intentions for the Switch, and he had pointed out that Nintendo had filed a patent for a VR headset that appeared to be um, intended for putting the switch into it and the switch seems too big for that and that's one of the big knocks about potentially doing that and there's also been some other news. also you wouldn't want to use a six inch screen at 720p for vr yeah i'm not i'm not too familiar with vr but from what i've heard you want more high resolution for mm -hmm. vr purposes high resolution low latency high frame rate mm-hmm you need like all three of those. I could definitely see the high frame rate. Otherwise, like people get discombobulated enough with VR mm -hmm. as is. Low frame rate is is not going to make things any better. But yeah, all but those the other things... the other point that you've got here has me really really intrigued. AR. Yeah, um, Matt Pat went the extra step and made the claim that Nintendo's real goal is to try to hit a really untapped market and be the first like major game company to jump into augmented reality and use the switch for that. Now the problem with that theory is that this device has no cameras whatsoever. But so Matt Pat's comeback for that was, well, 
you've got these nice slots on the side, so you could just <laughs> modular, jo- yeah, module modulize it, make some Joy-Con sized camera attachment to be able to just slide on it, and you're, um, and you'd be good to go. Which- That's actually a really brilliant point that I had never thought of before, and I haven't heard anybody bring up is like, y- they have these railings built into the system. You could just add peripherals. Mm-hmm. To this thing willy nilly, and the slide stuff in there works via Bluetooth and NFC, I believe. So third party peripherals, modular peripherals. Well, I don't know about third party, but like Nintendo could design. That, yeah, Nintendo their could own. easily do that. But yeah, and then aside from Matt Pat speculation with the patent that Nintendo filed for, I saw this other video just yesterday. That was mm-hmm. posted yesterday, a couple days ago, where apparently somebody was digging around in some code related to the Switch and stuff and found code that apparently has like a VR mode flag somewhere. Mm. So the so Nintendo definitely has been thinking a lot on being able to use the Switch for VR purposes. Okay. Um, will we actually see that? I'm not sure based on the very limited knowledge I have with VR stuff, it would be quite the hurdle. Or maybe you use a phone app from Nintendo (laughs) to use your phone for VR purposes, and then the Switch just ends up being a hub of some sort for the game that you're playing. That would be bizarre. I mean, at that that point, they should just make it a mobile, you know, game. Mm -hmm. But Nintendo. (laughs) Oh, boy. Let's see. What do we have in miscellaneous? It's a portable console, but the console is also very portable. <laughs> that's that's literally what I say about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a portable console, but the console is also very portable. And what I mean by that is that the whole setup for wanting to um, have it as a home console that you plug into your TV. So the Switch itself, plus the dock, plus the power cable, plus the HDMI cable. Mm-hmm. All together is extremely portable. Like, if you think, uh, I mean, people have been coming up with fancy ways of taking apart their dock to make it extremely small, but it's already very small. Mm -hmm. Take that compared to any other home console right now, your Xbox One or Xbox X now, um, or your PS4 or your PS4 Slim, it's still a whole of a heck lot easier to haul this around. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mentioned earlier that I traveled out to Japan to visit a friend of mine with this and I brought the whole setup with me like when I flew out to Japan I brought everything in well I just packed like a week's worth of clothes and and my switch in like one duffel bag and mm-hmm. that's what what I had and so when I got to my friend's house I was able to just easily unpack the switch plug it into his TV and playing Legend of Zelda in five minutes there we go so that has been very nice yeah. All right. So, any final words to sum up this whole thing? Just looking at the Switch overall, it does have some very fair criticisms to it, particularly mm-hmm. when it was initially launched. There were so many questions about right. uh, what's this going to be, what's that going to be. Even after they had launched, after they had announced the the specs for it, there's still all of these questions up in the air. And now things are a lot more settle down like even just like a month after the console had launched things just really settled down yeah and so now you've got a small number of big knocks like the 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 memory the the storage issue of your game game files files are tied to the console of the weirdness of their online chat app Mm -hmm. as it is right now and then but then everything else um associated with the switch it's just very quirky (laughs) Um, is probably the best way to put it. And all the quirks you can, um, they're not, they're not really bad things. They're just things that you have to get used to. Mm -hmm. And so me personally, I love it. I would definitely recommend it for other people. Um, Particularly anybody who are, who is a Nintendo fan for me personally, my last home console was the Wii. My last handheld console was the Game Boy Advance. So for at least like, 
six years now. I haven't had you're, much... You're the prodigal son coming back. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I have always been very much a Nintendo fan. I grew up with the 64 and the GameCube. And so for me personally, I love being able to get back into my Nintendo IPs, particularly mm-hmm. Legend of Zelda. I'm a huge Legend of Zelda fan. So being able to come back into it with a game like Breath of the Wild is amazing. So overall, big picture notes... It's a pretty quirky console with some uh, very legitimate criticisms to it, mm-hmm. but overall, it's it's a good it's a good serv- serviceable console just as far as like using it. And then right now, it's got some really great games with some previously announced great games that are just right on the horizon. Yeah. And at this point, the only big questions that we still have are related to the online service the that service ha- ha- and yeah. will they fix some issues yep that are presently out there so mm-hmm. yeah for me being somebody who has never really been interested in a console in general you know mm-hmm. um because like one of my guiding stars is like my devices have to be able to do literally everything that I could possibly want. Yeah. Um, this comes closest to being a console that I, that I want to buy yeah. um, for sure. And it's, and it's all about that, you know, being able to take the games with me on, wh- the, go. on the go. Yep. Um, and not having to sacrifice like, okay, I'm on the go. Now I have to play different games than when I'm at home. Mm-hmm. And know? it's kind of interesting when you just look on the, look at the evolution of Nintendo consoles as a whole because when you look back and they even had this kind of talk with the official launch and Nintendo higher-ups have had this kind of talk before and that they've always, like, this is kind of something that they have always been kind of working towards Mm because even going, they've always had in mind that they want to bring people together to play to, to play video games yeah and you could see it even as back as obviously with like the game boy or game boy advance you know taking games on the go and the evolution of those handheld systems and connecting people together mm-hmm. but even like the gamecube they purposely made it really tiny and with a handle on yeah, it, a- so that you could bring it to your friend's house um and be able to play video games on and so particularly with the jump from the wii u to this one because the wii u was really the really really trying to work a lot harder towards towards what you were saying of being able to take take player games at home and take them on the go and we use basically their trial on that and mm-hmm. just them finally actually reaching the point of this is probably what they have always strived for for the last 30 40 years mm-hmm. and now breaking new ground with it it's really exciting yeah So thanks for listening to this episode of Second Opinion, everybody. If you want to see the show notes and links to things that we talked about in this episode, go to thenexus.tv slash SO27. Once again, that is thenexus.tv slash SO27. Um, Or if you like somehow heard only half of this episode and you uh, need to go and listen to the entire thing, the entire episode is archived there, of course. I have been Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. And I'm Josh Schumacher. I don't really have Twitter. I have a Twitter handle, where, but I don't... Where, where can people find you on the internet? Um, people could, people can find my um, Twitter handle that has nothing attached to it at Schumeister24, or you can find me on Facebook as Josh Schumacher. There we go. Maybe you'll find me on the Switch. Ooh. <laughs> and if you would like to get in touch with uh, the network, go to Twitter and uh, search up The Nexus TV um, or send us an email at TV at gmail.com. We're always looking for people to suggest stuff for us to review um, or if you have something that we haven't reviewed yet and you want to come on as a guest, we would love to have you. Have a good one. Have a good one.